Welcome to our service this afternoon. Today is the best of all days. Pray with me if you would. Praise to you, conquering King. You did it. You did it for us. We give you praise how great and wonderful you are. This is the day that brings hope and joy to us beyond all others. You've proved yourself, and for this we give you thanks in your very own name. Amen. Yes, indeed, today, of all the days, is the very best. Jesus proved that everything he said, everything he promised about himself or what he would do for those who believe in him was true. Our faith is not based on something pie in the sky, but on an objective truth, an objective fact, and that is the empty tomb. We don't often get to sing Easter hymns, and perhaps you've sung some of these already today, but we're going to sing them again. Interspersed with the hymns, I'm going to read from a devotional that my mom gave me, and it has some wonderful words of comfort for us. It says, Easter Sunday records the greatest event in the history of the world. Made alive in the Spirit, Jesus breaks the portals of Hades and opens the way from the dark valley of death to the fair land of life. The power of death is now broken. The powers of death must surrender also the body. This is what happened on Easter Sunday when the body of Jesus was raised from the dead. This is wonderful. Our first hymn is the one I played for the prelude, and that is number 239, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, and we will be singing verses 1, 3, and 5. I know that my Redeemer lives, what joy this blessed assurance gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living head. He lives to bless me with his love. my hungry soul to feed. He lives to help in time of need. He lives all glory to His name. He lives my Savior still the joy this blessed assurance gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. But the Easter Gospel has a still more glorious message to us who are not only marked by death, but also in ourselves death-centered criminals. It proclaims to us that the bodily resurrection of Christ is God's own signature affixed to the letter of pardon which, which Jesus applied on our behalf. When God ushered Jesus out through the portals of death and brought forth his body from the tomb, he made it clear to heaven and earth, yes, to hell also, that he had put his seal of approval upon that reconciliation with the race which was effaced, excuse me, affected by the death of Jesus. Therefore, the apostle says, raised for our justification. We are going to sing... Number 254, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hearts to Heaven. Alleluia. 
Alleluia, Alleluia, hearts to heaven and voices raise. Sing to God a hymn of gladness, sing to God a hymn of praise. He who on the cross a victim for the world's salvation bled. Jesus Christ, the King of glory, now is risen from the dead. Alleluia, Christ is risen, death at last has met defeat. See the ancient powers of evil in confusion and retreat. Once he died and once was buried, now he lives forevermore. Jesus Christ, the world's Redeemer, whom we worship and adore. Christ is risen, we are risen, set your hearts on things above. There in all the Father's glory lives and reigns our King of love. Hear the word of peace he brings us, see his wounded hands and side. Now let every wrong be ended, every sin be crucified. Alleluia, alleluia, glory be to God on high. Alleluia to the Savior who has gained the victory. Alleluia to the Spirit, fount of love and sanctity. Alleluia, alleluia to the triune majesty. Here we have Easter's most joyous message. My acquittal papers with God's own signature affixed thereto have been ready and waiting for me since Easter morning. If I stand beneath the cross of Jesus, I can read the charge that was against me, but I can see also that it has been transferred to my Savior's account. In his open tomb, I find again my God-given proof that Jesus paid for my sins, for your sins, and we are free. Who is it he who is it that condemneth? It is Christ Jesus that died, yea, rather that was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God. Alleluia. Our final hymn is number 243, which is Christ is alive. Christ is alive, let Christians sing. The cross stands empty to the sky. Let streets and homes with praises ring. Love drowned in death shall never die. Christ is alive, no longer bound. To distant years in Palestine, but saving, healing here and now, and touching every place and time. Not thrown to far, remotely bound, untouched unmoved by human pains, but daily in the midst of life, our Savior, the Godhead, reigns. If you are with some other folks where you are uh, watching this, I invite you to greet those folks. If you are not with anyone, you need to know that you are still not alone. Jesus, by his Spirit, is with you in your place. Listen to what the writers of the Heidelberg Catechism say about Christ's resurrection. The question is, 
How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he won for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already now resurrected to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a guarantee of our own glorious resurrection. Our faithful Savior has purchased forgiveness for us. I don't know if you've ever had to ask for forgiveness from someone that you've offended. That's not an easy thing to do. Our culture is more used to pointing blame instead of taking responsibility. The person who grants forgiveness is the one who pays the bigger price because that person sets aside the urge for revenge or retaliation. How sweet it is to taste forgiveness. Of course, Jesus paid the great price. He went the whole way and he did it for us. May that sink way down deep into our hearts. He didn't have to do it. He chose to do it for us. We have a place now in God's family because of what he did for us. How can that be? I would like to invite you to come with me to the throne of God where we can praise and thank him for what he has done. Let us pray. Glorious and victorious Savior, you did it. You made it happen. You faced our foes and you vanquished them forever. Done. You have purchased with your own precious life and blood a place for us in the redeemed. This is amazing. You bring hope to the hopeless, freedom to the shackled, purpose to the confused, and comfort to the troubled. You are everything that you said you were, Jesus, the bread of life, the living water, the good shepherd, the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection and the life, the Savior, the Redeemer. Words cannot express what needs to be said. We give you thanks. We praise your name. We are in a crisis, O Lord. We know that there are tens of thousands of people who are suffering, and we would ask that you would bring comfort where that's needed. We especially lift up to you health care workers, the suppliers of needed equipment, scientists who are working feverishly to come to some kind of a vaccine. We pray for leaders and officials of our country who are making difficult decisions which impact us all. We pray for our pastors and leaders here at First Reformed Church and in other congregations as well. Take our lives and make them useful for you. Help us walk in the power of Jesus' resurrection. We give you thanks in your own precious name. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and happy Easter. This is a beautiful day that we can celebrate the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that maybe the weather isn't so, so nice to go enjoy an outside walk or enjoy the afternoon, but uh, I'm glad that we can be together this way. I know there's so many aspects of the Easter weekend from Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter uh, services that we are used to having uh, that time spent together. And I'll be honest, there's a side of me that's really, really sad that we couldn't be together on Monday, Thursday evening and the men of the community gathering uh, to go to the community uh, Good Friday men's breakfast uh, every year. That's something my family, my son and I look forward to every year. But this is going to have to do where we can spend some time together. And as we've been talking about um, recently in our evening services, our afternoon services, uh, about the locations in Lent, um, I'm going to be talking tonight about the garden tomb. 
where Jesus was laid to rest and um, where the disciples and, and the women came and discovered that Jesus was not there, but was, was risen. And with that, that gives me great joy. There's a number of resurrection passages in the Bible. Um, if you have time and want to, it's a great uh, devotional exercise just to read the last um, couple chapters of each gospel, and you can identify and see uh, the uniqueness of each gospel, what what is shared, as well as uh, the beauty of uh, that morning, the resurrection morning, and hearing about the location where they went, um, that it wasn't necessarily um, real close by, but yet at the same time, it wasn't far away for the disciples to get there, that they could walk there, they could run there, even uh, as what uh, the, the gospel writers share. This is a hallmark moment of our faith, and this is a hallmark location where this happens of going to the tomb and understanding and seeing that it's empty. Uh, I thought this week I saw a lot of, uh, of um, images on social media saying, don't worry that your church is empty the tomb was empty as well. And friends, that's uh, something that gives us great hope, saying the tomb is empty and it's uh, something beautiful. Uh, part, for part of our service this evening, I just want to read a couple of uh, gospel passages, one from the book of Luke and one from the book of John. And we can see kind of the uh, differences that are uh, uniquely, uh, uniquely different. We got to hear this morning uh, the Matthew account of the resurrection of uh, Easter Sunday as shared by the church. And I thought that was just uh, wonderful. That was beautiful, uh, very worshipful for me to hear the different voices and see the different faces sharing that great uh, passage from Matthew. But here it is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Friends, so ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. And here from the Gospel of John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight to, into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They just still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary had stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? 
They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and realized Jesus standing there. And she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Then he said, thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Friends, so ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to God. You can hear in those two accounts some similarities and some differences. Some of the order that things are happening are are a little different. And I'm going to tell you here right now, this is not going to be a message that's going to be talking about the contextual differences between the synoptic gospels and the fourth gospel or John's gospel, but rather thinking about the location, thinking about the, the experience that Mary had going to the tomb early in the morning, the disciples running to the tomb, um, being out of breath and, and stopping uh, and peering into the tomb. And then the other, Peter specifically barging and going right on in and discovering what had happened. And what a joyous moment with that, but yet also what a bewildering moment as well. Wondering what had happened, not putting two and two together of the scripture and the words that Jesus had said previously and realizing now that this was coming uh, to true. Whenever I hear of these locations of the garden tomb, I can't help but think of my experience of visiting uh, these locations in Israel. When I was uh, about halfway through my seminary experience, I had the opportunity to go to Israel on a tour. Now, uh, it was a little different than uh, the regular holy site tour. We got to go to see a number of those places, but one of the seminary requirements for all the students um, was to take part of an intercultural immersion. And this was a specific trip aimed at just that, of visiting and talking and seeing the different places where Jews, Muslims, and Christians come together uh, and and are really forced to kind of live together. And we know that uh, throughout history, this has been a hotbed for conflict. Uh, These conversations were interesting to say uh, the least. We visited with Jewish rabbis, we visited with Muslim imams, and we visited with pastors of the Christian churches as well. The unique thing of our stay, we stayed in the city of Bethlehem, and I stayed in the Bethlehem Inn, and friends, I can say there was vacancy and there was room for us to stay there. Uh, We saw a number of the historical biblical sites that we went to, some from the Old Testament, some from the New Testament, but a couple places really stick out in my mind as I think back to my time that was spent there. And I, in fact, in getting ready for this, took out my uh, Israel um, uh, souvenir box that I keep in my office. And it's got a number of different things uh, that I have held on to here. Uh, yeah, I got some money, uh, some shekels from uh, from Israel, and uh, that the money that we had to use, some coins, it's probably uh, not worth a whole lot here. I've never turned it back in again. Uh, I have a bunch of photos that some have been put into uh, uh, a little photo book and I realized, and actually I have the double prints that I could get back then because you could turn in your roll of film and get two sets for free. Uh, One set we had to pay for, the other set you got free. Uh, And I realized quickly uh, that I was there with my little 35 millimeter camera, that I was not a great photographer. And so I actually bought some postcards of the photos and the things that I was taking pictures of, as well as uh, the things I wanted to remember. And towards the end of the trip, I even 
decided to buy a book that had all these uh, sites that we saw, plus a whole bunch more in here that I could remember those well and, and got to see pictures of uh, the place where Jesus was crucified and also his tomb. Now, if you go to Israel, you'll see a couple of locations that they will take you to. One um, is where they feel the rock of Calvary is, as well as the tomb. Scripture shares that with us, that those two places were fairly close together. Now, I say two places, uh, and you might be scratching your head there a little bit, because one is actually called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the other location is known as the Garden Tomb. And I believe we have a photo here of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this is, is inside a church building. They built a church over the top of the site. And uh, throughout history, that place has been destroyed and rebuilt uh, through uh, the ages of time. And you can read about that on, on your own. But that place uh, is, a, is a place, as you can maybe see in this photo, uh, filled with ornaments. The, the flooring is, is, uh, has different colors and is designed differently. You see uh, some, some maybe incense, some candles that are there, some uh, glass covering a rock that they feel like is the place where, where Christ was, was crucified. There's a chapel off to the side where they feel his tomb was. And this, this is the place that uh, scholars have said that this is most likely the place where this occurred, uh, where Jesus was crucified, where he was laid to rest, but also where he rose again. Uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is within the city of Jerusalem, uh, and it's a very busy place. There's a lot of people coming and going. You see folks dressed in their full vestments, priests and, and others, uh, pilgrims and followers of, of Christ. Some people having worship services right there that you kind of walk right on through while this is happening. And then the other place uh, is what's called the Garden Tomb. And this is a place that... Uh, has been excavated, and they actually dated this way back to Old Testament time, so it's most likely not the place where, where Jesus uh, was laid to rest, but it's very much a place that was probably like the place Jesus was, was laid to rest. And if I had to choose a favorite spot and favorite experience that I had in Israel, it was at this garden tomb because it was outside for one, it was easy to start to think about uh, what it was like for the disciples who came to the garden tomb uh, as you ran down the steps or, and got to the place and, and went to the door and seeing how uh, the, the stone had been rolled away and this small room that you could stick your head in thinking um, of one of the disciples peering in from the outside and, and Peter running through that was very easy to uh, put yourself into their shoes. Plus, uh, the Gospel of John talks about that in chapter 19, verse 41. Now, I'll read with you right now. It says this, Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now, both of these places have been preserved through modern history. Uh, the garden tomb... Um, has been uh, operating for the last 150 years or so. Um, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has been in existence for much, much longer time than that. In my own personal experience of seeing the tomb and stepping into that was just wonderful. It was beautiful uh, to experience and see. And it's perhaps that was the, the reason why it was so meaningful to me was it was just the surrounding atmosphere of being able to connect with those early followers of Jesus and discovering that he was not dead, but he certainly was alive. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it was many people dressed in their vestments, busy, happening, going on, and at the garden tomb, it was quiet. You could imagine how quiet it was when Mary went to the tomb early in the morning, maybe just hearing the birds chirping outside, um, and, and yet very sad, um, wondering what does this mean for them? Their, their Lord, their Savior, their teacher was dead. And then how quickly that changed when they realized that he was alive. And without a doubt, Mary speaking to Jesus. 
But I think another reason why it was so meaningful to me was the beauty of the garden. When we were at the garden tomb in Israel, the garden there was just coming to life. We had left Michigan in mid-January, and if you've ever been to that portion of the country, to uh, southwest Michigan in mid-January, it can be kind of uh, dreary. There's a lot of cloudy days. Uh, there's a lot of snow. There's a lot of moisture that comes in off the lake, and we lived near, near that, so we would get a lot of snow. And we were into an area where it wasn't necessarily warm, like the, the southwest portion of uh the country where it's 70 or 80 degrees, but it was probably 50 and 60 degrees when we were there. And in this garden, we had started to see the, the grass starting to green up, trees uh, starting to bear their leaves, starting to bud, early flowers starting to uh, come into the world. Being there gave us hope that the misery of the winter was going away soon and the beauty and the explosion of life that happens in spring uh, was about to happen. And friends, that is, is just an awesome thing to be thinking about when we celebrate Easter this year in 2020. That it was much like those who arrived at the tomb first. They were facing sadness. They were facing wonder, facing what's going to happen and they were faced with a wonderful excitement that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was alive. Maybe we're feeling that right now with a little bit of hopelessness with the COVID-19 pandemic. We're watching the news differently, or maybe you're watching just bits and pieces and can only take in so much each day, uh, longing for that moment when they give the all clear. And, and we pray that uh, as we're praying uh, through this weekend, that God will do a, a remarkable thing, um, that the, the pandemic will come to an end. And Lord, and, and, and we also think about that, and I'm thinking about even praying it right now. Lord, may this come to an end soon, that we can come back to church, come back to life as we know, and get to do the things that we want to do. It's friends, because of the resurrection of Jesus, that we can have hope. We can have hope that the time that we're living in right here and right now will come to an end. The struggles that we face now are temporary because the tomb was empty. Sin has been defeated. Death has been conquered. And we can look forward to that glorious day when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior that we have hope. This past week, I saw a number of people sharing their life verses on Facebook, um, and those are, are wonderful and they're beautiful. It's really inspiring to me of hearing how God's Word has had a personal impact on people's lives. And there was one that spoke to me that really talks about kind of these texts and these moments that um, I just shared about going to the garden tomb and realizing that Jesus was alive and what a difference that makes in our life. And this comes from the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-9. through 9. Peter writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mis mi mercy, He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you, I'm going to change it to we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the given revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I don't know about you, but perhaps you heard that and saw that um, as Peter is talking about faith, living into the resurrected Christ, saying we rejoice in that, even though 
for a little while, you've been grieved by various trials. Yes, friends, this has been a, a very trying time over the last number of weeks. And we long for our lives to come back to a new normal. Our normal of coming and going, running errands without worrying about wearing a mask or having gloves on, interactions with people and, and getting close if, if we want to get close and, and extending our hands for a handshake or a hug instead of thinking about, I can only get six feet or even more, taking our kids to school and going to their extracurriculars and helping them with different things uh, to make those things successful and, and happy, making plans for vacations, weddings, graduations, celebrations, simple outings that we can know that their, their places will be open and that we can go to them. Those all in the big picture even though we long for them now, seem to be pretty simple, pretty easy things that will come back. But also there's other struggles that we face that, still re that we still have to face on this side of heaven. There's health concerns. There's the financial recovery uh, that will be taking place. People that have lost their jobs or have, have uh, had a cut in hours and have to uh, figure out financially how they're going to make their ends meet. There's without doubt emotional healing that will have to take place after this of the places that we are. But all those things considered and all and heavy as those struggles are, we know we have hope because in the garden tomb, the tomb was empty. It's him, Jesus, the resurrected savior that we put our trust. And for those that experienced the empty tomb, they left there with a great sense of hope. And friends, that's where we put our hope in our risen savior, Jesus. I couldn't help but think of the great hymn that we sing from time to time. It starts out this way, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. That's right. It's on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. The second verse says, when darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. And every high and stormy day, my anchor holds within the veil. Why? Because we stand on the solid rock of Jesus, who, friends, is alive. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we think about the place where the disciples and the, the others went and saw the tomb and expecting to see Lord, your body there and discovering that it was gone, that you were alive and that you were speaking to them. Help us to remember that each and every day as we face struggles, as we face trials and, and trouble in our life and things that we get frustrated with, Lord, we put our hope in you. And Lord, that means everything. That makes everything different. It makes everything bearable because our hope, our feet are grounded Lord, on you, the solid rock. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In our final set of hymns, we're going to be singing three hymns, one right after the other. The first one will be, He Lives, number 248, followed by 251, which is, Thine is the Glory. And we will end with number 238, Because He Lives. Unfortunately, in our hymnal only one verse appears, but we'll be singing all three verses of Because He Lives. Beginning with 248, then on to 251, and then 238. And also on the end of this song, I've changed a few words. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living. 
living, whatever others say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. In all the world around me I see his loving care, and though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation is assured. You ask me how I know he lives, it's written in his word. Number 251. the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou o'er death hast won. Angels in bright raiment roll the stone away, kept the grave cloths folded where thy body lay. Thine is the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou o'er death hast won. Lo, Jesus meets us, risen from the tomb. Lovingly he greets us, scatters fear and gloom. Let his church with gladness hymns of triumph sing. For the Lord now liveth, death has lost its sting. Thine is the glory, risen conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou o'er death hast won. No more we doubt thee, glorious Prince of life. Life is not without thee, aid us in our strife. Make us more than conquerors through thy deathless love. Bring us safe through Jordan to thy home above. and conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou o'er death hast won. 238, but we're going to add a couple verses. God sent his Son 
They call him Jesus. He came to live, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth a living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still the calm assurance this child can face on certain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know is worth a living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, the lights of lights of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future then life is worth a living just because he lives. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And brothers and sisters, as we prepare to close this service and you go on to the rest of your day, hear this blessing from God's word. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.